Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to cover all the verses uh, in the first 10 verses or so. And uh, we're going to pick actually pick one up from chapter 5 as well tonight. But uh, we're going to focus on, we're going to eventually get to, I guess I should say, verse number 9 of Galatians chapter 6 where the Bible says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, Father, we pray for your help as we <coughs> study your word together this evening. Lord, we bow before you and ask that you'd open our understanding as we look at this particular truth, that you'd help us to not be weary in well-doing. It surely must be something that we'd all struggle with from time to time, or you wouldn't have to put this in your word. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that each of us would understand just how we cannot be weary in well-doing, so that in due season we shall reap, because we didn't faint. Now, Father, guide us and lead us, and Spirit of God, uh, be the teacher here this evening. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be not weary in well-doing. Uh, you might be like Susie who called her friend on the telephone and said, asked how she was feeling. And her friend said, terrible. My head's splitting. My back and legs are killing me. The house is a mess. The kids are driving me crazy. Susie, who's full of compassion, said, listen, you just go lay down. I'm coming right over. I'm going to cook lunch for you. I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to take care of the children while you get some rest. That's wonderful. And then Susie said, by the way, how's Sam? And the voice on the other end of the telephone said, I don't have any husband named Sam. And Susie said, oh my, I must have called the wrong number. And then there was silence on the other end, and then the voice said, well, are you still going to come over? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she was weary and well-doing. What do you think? You know, everybody, whether it's normal work, whether it's spiritual work, there's a tendency to become weary, even in well-doing. Sometimes they call it burnout. Or somebody just, and everybody here, you've known somebody who's used that phrase to you. If you've been saved any lengths of time, uh, you may have known somebody who, in fact, I was talking to someone the other night. Was it, was it you, John, uh, or Cheryl, that uh, the, the couple that got them into church isn't in church anymore? You know what I mean? People who encourage you along the way, then somewhere along the line, they got weary in well-doing, and they dropped out and they got discouraged they got they got tired of giving or tired of doing or tired of serving uh they just the the joy goes and the the the, the enthusiasm's gone and uh the lord told us let us not be weary in well doing in fact two places here in galatians 6 9 and over in second thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 he again repeated it be not weary in well doing now weary is this, it's having your strength exhausted by toil or by exertion. It means you're tired, it means you're fatigued. I really like this definition of it. It says, when the mind is yielding to discouragement. The mind is yielded to discouragement. So that's something that, that all of us will face at one time or another. You can get weary in well-doing. But the command here is to not be weary. Well, then, then the question comes, how can I not be weary in well-doing? And I think we have some answers right here in the book of Galatians uh, in this passage that we're looking at in front of us this evening. Let's start up in verse number 26 of Galatians chapter 5. And the way to be not weary is to be not desiring recognition. You, don't get, you will not get weary in well-doing if you will not desire recognition. Notice what verse 26 of chapter 5 says. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, 
envying one another. And, and by the way, look what precedes that. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And again, that's following the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. So it says it's possible that even someone who is endeavoring to have the fruit of the Spirit in their life, who's endeavoring to walk in the Spirit, and to, to, because they, they're alive in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, it's possible for that person to be proud that they're spiritual. And by the way, once you're proud you're spiritual, you're not spiritual anymore. Okay? God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. There are people, I've, I've listened to people say, well, they didn't handle that well because they're not as spiritual as I am. I've had people make that comment. And, and, you know, when someone makes a comment like that, they're not spiritual. Then their, their, their vain glory, the chief cause of slander, the chief cause of criticism is pride. Man thinking himself better than somebody else. People wanting vain glory, empty glory. It was like, uh, it was the, the fellow in 3 John that, that John wrote about. Do you remember him? In uh, the book of 3 John, he talked about the fellow who wanted to have the preeminence in the church. Diotrephes. He loves to have the preeminence. You know what it was? The vain glory. He wanted to, to, to let everybody know that, that he was something else. And so he wanted to have the attention in the church. And that's pride. When you start thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Hmm? When you meet somebody at the door, you meet somebody who comes into church, and you say, hi, you know, I'm a Sunday school teacher here, I'm a deacon here, or I'm this here, or I'm that here. You know, we're, you know, we all are, we're all just servants of God here. That's what we are. And uh, don't, no, there's no big shots, there's no little shots, we're just all just drips. That's what we are, all right? We're just all trying to do what we can for God. And, and <clears throat> don't be thinking of vain glory. Don't get prideful. Prideful is when you look at certain situations, whether it's the pastor, whether it's a, a, a choir member, whether it's the choir leader, the song leader, maybe it's somebody singing and you say, well, if I was doing that, I would have done this. If I was, you know, I don't know why they made that decision, I'd have done this thing. And, and it, you know, what, what you learn is you don't know everything that the leader knows. And, and what you have to do is you have to think, well, if I knew everything that, that they knew, I probably would be making the same decision they're making. But pride says, oh, I would do that. That's what happens in any shop, you know, when everybody, the workers talk about the management. Well, wow, why'd they do this? I don't know what they're doing up there. Well, no, because you don't know everything they know. You don't, they're not, you're not privy to their information. It's prideful to think otherwise. And, and pride will destroy your life. Pride will destroy your usefulness by God. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You can, you can be too big for God to use. You'll never be too small for God to use. William Carey, you know that name? William Carey, one of the first missionaries and uh, went to India and, uh, and back in the 18th century. And he was being honored by the general governor of India and at, that, at the dinner where they were honoring him was another official of the government who, who didn't like William Carey and didn't like the whole missionary movement. He was quite contemptible to him. And at the dinner party, he said openly to a friend, this William Carey, and he said it loud enough for William Carey to hear it, this William Carey, understand, he was a shoemaker. And William Carey heard him. And he looked at him and he said, Sir, I was not a shoemaker. I was a cobbler. Okay? Do you understand? What he was saying is, you can't hurt me. You can't. I've already. I, I, uh, in other words, I'm, I'm low enough, you can't get me any lower. You understand? I, I'm dead to self. You can cut me all you want. You can cut a dead man all you want. He doesn't hurt. See? Whenever, whenever we tend to say we're hurt, it's because pride is there. Pride is there. 
And so we have to be careful. And, 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 and there he is, died to himself, died to every ambition. So let us not be desirous of vain glory. And then it says what happens is we begin to provoke one another and we begin to envy one another. We, we begin to provoke. Provoke means to make angry, to offend or to incense. It's the idea of where it says in Ephesians, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't, don't do that. They're, they're, you get tempted to shame someone else because they didn't do something like you do it. Or they didn't do something as well as what you think you do it. It's, it's like, it's like if, uh, we're out, if we're out in the kitchen and someone says, Brother Bowman, uh, open this jar and Brother Bowman can't open it. But Brother Bill's there. And Brother Bill says, here, give me that thing. And Bill pops that lid off. Okay? And that's fine. Until he looks at Brother Bowman and says, you wimp. You know what he just did? Now he provoked him. See, he provoked him. He's using uh, his strength. Now, that's just a physical example, but sometimes people do that spiritually. And we, we, we flaunt some spiritual aspect that whether it's loving somebody, caring for somebody, forgiving somebody, and someone else is struggling with it, and we say, well, come on, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? Just, just get over this and forgive them. And we kind of we, we kind of uh, lord it over them. And you can provoke somebody to anger. Be, remember, we're to, we're to speak the things that build other people up, not tear them down. We're to, we're to edify, not destroy. And don't destroy people with what you say. And, and that goes with pride. Pride always thinks... I'll seem bigger if I can make someone else seem smaller. If I can, I can cut them down. So I'll provoke other people. And, and, and then it says, we not only provoke one another, we do what? Envy one another. Envy one another. God is blessing someone else bearing fruit in their life and, and they're, they're being blessed or they get an answer to prayer or they end up, you see God prospering their class or God prospering them in ministry or God prospering them materially. And you know what you do? You get envious. How come they get a car like that and I can't? I got to drive this clunker. Hmm? Well, how come, how come they got to sing and nobody had me sing? How come they got to teach? How, how come he picked him to do that? I don't know. I never get to do anything. You see? And we get envious. Pride. Pride. We get desirous of recognition. Well, you want to get weary? You get weary real quick when you want to be recognized for what you do and you don't get the recognition. Okay? That'll get you weary in well doing and you'll end up quitting. I don't know how many, you, you probably heard people say, Well, I did this and the pastor didn't say anything about it, or nobody recognized what I did. Nobody, nobody appreciates me over there. Hmm? People begin to say that. Well, I just wasn't appreciated. I did more than anybody at that church. See? You see how much pride is in those statements? And envying and provoking one another. So, you, you do not become weary in well-doing by not desiring recognition. Now, the second thing is verse number 1, chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. Now, we're going to be involved. If you're not going to get weary in well-doing, you're going to be involved in restoration. Restoration. Someone says, we, we are to go and make disciples. That's evangelism. We are to mark disciples. That's by baptism. Obeying the Lord in baptism. We're to mature disciples or mature disciples, and, 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 and that is discipleship. 
But we are to mend disciples, and that is restoration. Now, you notice that someone who's broken then, and again, people who get overtaken in a fault are not bad, they're broken. Okay? You don't throw them away, you fix them. You, you mend them. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. In other words, you don't meet people that have been overtaken in a fault and you don't meet them with condemnation, you meet them with compassion. You see a brother or sister that's hurting, you do your part to help them. You're doing your part to point them back to the Lord. And you do that as we talked about Sunday with the spirit of meekness, that, that lubricant, that, that ability to, that you can do it without causing friction but help them to get back in place. Overtaken, overtaken in a fault means you're, you're brought back to a useful place again. Or, I'm sorry, I'm talking about restoration. Overtaken in a fault simply means you've been overtaken. You've been, you've been not necessarily, I was going to say not willful, but all sins willful. Um, but it's not something that necessarily was premeditated or preplanned, but you just simply got caught, taken by surprise. And it, it, it grabbed you. Listen, every one of us are, is pursued by sin. We're pursued by Satan. We're pursued by the flesh. That's what, that's what that temptation is. We're pursued. And in, in, in Galatia here, they were pursued in the form of evil te- of false teachers that wanted them to go back into Judaism. In other words, that, that, not, yeah, have faith in Christ, but you also have to keep some of these laws and you have to do some of these other things too in order to be saved. That's why Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from the gospel I gave you into another gospel, which is not another. And he, he was marveling at how quickly they had turned away from Christ. So here's somebody that gets overtaken in a fault, and notice it's brethren. These are saved people. These are part of the church, part of the body. And by the way, that's why it's good to be in a church body. That, that if something does overtake you and you end up falling and, and, and you have a fault, you're overtaken by that, you have people that are going to help you get out of that. You have people that are going to help point you back to the Lord. If you're not in that body of believers and you don't have others who are going to help you in the spirit of meekness, you're done. you got nobody to help you. You got no one to help point you back to God. And so it's important to be part of a church family. Now, when it says restore such a one, it literally means to mend or to repair. It, it's literally a word that's used that means you're setting a broken bone or repairing a dislocated limb. So it's, it's bringing that person back and setting them back in the rightful place the place of service, the place of blessing. One pastor said this, sin is the breakdown in the machinery of our life and it has to be repaired. If you find someone with a breakdown, do what you need to do in order to restore the person to good, godly, running condition and get them running for God again. Get the part repaired. That's our reconciliation is our ministry to fallen sinners. Restoration is our ministry to fallen saints. You're familiar with the song, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. That's that's the ministry of reconciliation. That's soul winning. That's reaching people before they go to hell. But, But when it says, weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, that's, that's talking about the Christian. There's another verse in that song that says, down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. See, that's, that's restoration. And we have both that ministry in, of reconciliation and restoration. Now, How does that happen? It happens by verse 2. Bearing one another's burdens. 
and so fulfilling the laws of Christ. Burdens are extra heavy loads. And burdens are difficulties. Burdens are troubles, problems that people are facing. The, it can even be the, 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 the faults, the sins the, of verse 1. That's a burden. You know, uh, sin is a burden. And it's a burden not only before you're saved, it's a burden after you're saved. You're sinning. You carry a burden that God never intended for you to carry. And it's a load that you, you carry. And, and God says, hey, it, you help carry the burden. If we see somebody burdened, we ought to want to do something about it and want to help them bear their burden. And so get them into a right relationship with God and try to restore them onto the right path again. won't have time to go into it tonight, but when James talks about our temptation, we get, we get lured off the path, the, the, the way of living for God, and lured off that path. Satan loves to do that. He doesn't care what other path we take just so we don't take, take the path God has for us. And so we want to get back on that path and get back to where he is in the ministry of restoration. And so we bear one another's burdens because that's the law. Notice, it fulfills the law of Christ. Jesus said, a new commandment give unto you. What's the new commandment? That ye love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another. He's saying, I got a new commandment, now you're going to love. What's love do? Love is a willing, sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of somebody else with no thought of return. Say, now here's my new commandment. You're going to help other people and you're going to help bear their burden and you're not looking for them to do anything for you. You're just going to help bear burdens. That fulfills the law of Christ. And you can't have any restoration if you're not willing to enter in and bear the burden. So you have to be willing to be a burden bearer. I like Howard Hendricks. He told the story of a young man who strayed from the Lord but was finally brought back with the help of a friend who really loved him. When there was full restoration, Dr. Hendricks asked the Christian, how, how did you feel when you were away from God? And the young man said it seemed like he was out at sea in deep water and in deep trouble. And all his friends were on the shore hurling biblical accusations at him about justice and penalty and wrongdoing. But he said, there was one Christian brother who actually swam out to get me and would not let me go. Oh, I fought him. But he pushed aside my fighting. He grasped me, put a life jacket around me, and he took me all the way to shore. He said, by the grace of God, he was the reason that I was restored. He would not let me go. See, bear ye one another's burdens. That's part of the restoration. And, and, and you, you have to be involved in restoration. Yes, rescue the perishing. We have to get folks saved. But you understand there's a great ministry in just trying to mend the Christians that are broken. That's, that's really what brought about uh, the RU ministry. RU recovery ministry is just the number of people that, have, that are broken uh, in their Christian Christian relationship in their, in their relationship with God. And they need help. And listen, there ought to be somewhere where they can get help. There ought to be somewhere where someone will say, I'll give you a hand out and, and I'll give you a hand up and uh, help you get back with God again. Uh, they got enough. How many of you, and, and I, I, I won't have you raise your hand, almost dead. Uh, but if you've ever been away from God, if you ever backslid or you ever had uh, some sin in your life, you know, and, and you did something wrong, you know, you know who feels the worst about that? You do. And really, the last thing you need is for somebody to come and point their finger at you. Because you know, you, 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 you're, you already know what a, what a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner you are. You know, it goes back to the, the pride thing of, of the first point. You know, when you start thinking that, that you're better than somebody else and you forget that, you know, uh, everything, every, every wicked sin that's available in our wicked heart is in my heart and your heart as well. Don't ever look at somebody and say, I'll never do that. You better say, by the grace of God, I'll never do that. With the help of God, I'll never do that. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
And don't say, don't say, well, not my heart. Oh, yeah, your heart. All of our hearts are that way. And so don't, don't get to thinking we're better than someone else. And, and be willing to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation and re- restoration. So we, we, we don't get weary by not being desirous of recognition, by being involved in restoration, and then thirdly, by being mindful of reaping. Be not deceived, verse 7. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I read as I was preparing for this lesson. I, I never heard of it before. I read that they have something called jogging in a jug. Have you ever heard of it? Jogging in a jug. It's a concoction of four parts grape juice, four parts apple juice, and one part apple cider vinegar. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? They say it's a, it's a home remedy for high cholesterol. They say it's Drano for your arteries. A couple ounces a day of this stuff, and it says your insides are going to be clean as a whistle. Now, I don't know about that. I'm, I haven't tried it. Don't think I will. But be amazing at jogging in a jug. In other words, you can drink this. You don't have to get up at, at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to the gym. You don't have to get out and walk around the block. You don't have to get on the treadmill or the Stairmaster or anything like that. You just have to drink this and you're going to be all right. You can, you can get out of, I mean, think about it. Just drink this stuff down and say, pass the donuts. How great would that be, huh? And, and, and by the way, it's not just in that area. There's all kinds of areas where, you know what, we're trying to bypass this law of sowing and reaping. We're trying to say, I want to sow, but I don't want to reap. But you can't, it doesn't work that way. It is God's universal law. And you can't repeal the law of sowing and reaping. Of actions have consequences. You cannot reverse that. Uh, and, and most of you know, you, you think for a while sometimes when you're younger that what you're eating doesn't affect you. How I many you found out when you got older that you found out that stuff you ate when you were younger is bothering you now? Huh? Yeah. And you look back and say, man, I wish I'd ate different back then. I was a, too much junk going in. And you know what we're doing? We're reaping what we've sown. You cannot stop that. And so... We, we all want to obey, we all want to enjoy the benefits without paying the price, but it doesn't work that way. Now, let me give you several things about sowing and reaping. Number one is this, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, verse 7, that shall he also reap. He said, you want to sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. You sow to the Spirit, you'll of the Spirit reap life uh, everlasting. And so he's, he's teaching us we sow what, whatever we sow is what we'll reap. You want to reap beans, you got to sow beans. If you sow peas, you're going to get peas. If you sow corn, you're going to get corn. Uh, don't, if you don't grow weary, but you continue to sow what you should sow and sow the right things and sow the good seed, you're going to reap a good harvest. So sowing and reaping, deed and consequence. Now let me ask you a question. What are you sowing in your life right now? What, did, what, what kind of seeds are you sowing in your life today? May 3rd, 2017. Are you seeking to please God? Hmm? How'd you spend your day to day? Any, any thought about what kind of a harvest is coming down the road because of the seeds you planted today? Have you given any thought about that? Have you planted some seeds of obedience? Have you planted some seeds of service? Words, actions, decisions? That all things we sow today that we're going to reap sometime. What are you sowing in your children's lives? 
What are you teaching them? What kind of example are you setting for them? What are you sowing into them that you know you can reap later? What are you sowing in your own spiritual life? Did you, did you open your Bible today and spend some time in your Bible? Did you sow some seeds in the Word of God? Did you sow some seed in prayer that will reap consequences in due season? Are you cultivating that relationship with God or are you neglecting your spiritual life? See, it's amazing how sometimes we, we, we don't read the Bible, we don't spend any time in prayer, we don't spend any time uh, cultivating relationship with God, and then we come to church Wednesday night and we wonder, man, I didn't get anything out of that message. Well, no, you didn't reap because you didn't sow. See? And you wonder, well, how come I'm not spiritual? How come I'm not, I don't have a desire to witness? I don't have a desire to do anything for God. What, what kind of seeds are you sowing? You won't reap what you don't sow. You reap what you sow. What about your relationship with others? You're sowing peace or you're sowing discord? You're sowing criticism or you're sowing encouragement? You're sowing praise to someone else? What do you fill your own mind with? What did, you, what did you sow into yourself today by your eye gate and by your ear gate? By what you saw and what you heard? What did you allow to come in and take a seed in your heart, in your life, that will one day come out in a harvest? What kind of fruit are you expecting? It depends on the seed you're planting. You reap what you sow. But secondly, you also reap more than you sow. And by the way, if you think that you don't reap what you sow, and, and there's always, you always have somebody who will tell you, now, usually it's young people. And you'll have someone older than you say, now listen, you shouldn't do that. Trust me. I've been there. I know what happens. Don't do that. And you know what they think? They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, it may happen to you. It's not going to happen to me that way. And, uh, you know, you can tell them you're, you're, so, you're going to reap what you sow all you want, and they don't want to listen to you. That's why God said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Don't you think you'll be the exception? You won't. You will reap what you sow. Don't think that you'll mock God and say, no, God, you don't know what you're talking about. And when you live and you think you're going to reap something that you didn't sow, huh, then you're, you're mocking God and what He says in His Word. Don't do that. The second law I want you to understand with sowing and reaping is you reap more than what you sow. The harvest is always greater than the seed you plant. Farmers kind of count on that, don't they? You have to. No farmer would ever plant anything if that wasn't the case. You've you got to expect more than just a one-to-one -one ratio or you'll never ever make a profit and never able to have enough to live on. In fact, you remember the parable of the sower that Jesus gave and not just the, the, the kind of ground, the, the stony and the thorny, and the, but he said the final soil was a soil that the, the seed fell on good ground and it brought forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. But all of that is more than what was sowed. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. But all of it is more than what was sowed. What about Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38 when the Bible talks about giving? Give and it shall be given unto you. Is that it? Oh, no. You have to give it unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, Shaken together and what? Running over. You know what it is? Much more than what you gave. God does that. God does that. Because you always will reap more than what you sow. That's a law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. You reap more than what you sow. And then 
The third thing is you reap in a different season than what you sow, than when you sow. Notice he says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's a due season. You don't plant something one night and it comes up the next day. It takes time, doesn't it? Sometimes people just get weary because their harvest doesn't come when they want it to. They don't see the results as quickly as they'd like to see the results. You can, you can see that's, that's what the church planner battles as he vid, knocks on doors and tries to witness to people. In seven months and saying, I've got maybe six families that come faithfully every week. But you see, he has to hang on to the promise that in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Don't get weary. Sometimes the harvest takes months, sometimes years, sometimes decades. Sometimes the harvest may come too late for you to see. You won't see it here on this earth. You may not, you may not see it in this life at all. You may not see it till you see Jesus and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, some of the harvest, some of the things you invest in that the missionaries that are on the field and the souls that are being saved and the lives that are being changed, some of those things, you're not going to see that until we get to heaven. We won't know the results of that sowing. The money you put into the missionaries, the money you've given to Faith Promise Missions so that folks can go and preach people with the gospel. You won't know the result of that until you get to heaven. And you hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Nothing good grows overnight. You have to exercise patience. It takes time and it takes patience between the planning and the reaping. And in, and in our case, listen, in God's work, he told, in, he told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, Sometimes some of us water. And sometimes some of us plant. But who is it that determines the increase? God gives the increase. God is, even when he said pray for laborers, he said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. It's his harvest. Who determines when it's harvest time? God does. God does. You and I cannot determine that. We have to wait until it's due season. And God determines when it's due season. Or you end up picking an immature harvest or picking, uh, picking something before it's ready to be harvested. And that can be tragic for that, that person and for you as well. The harvest takes time and it takes patience. And so, what do we do? Look at verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity... And by the way, when's our opportunity? Right now. <laughs> this is it. Your three score and ten or, or, or four score, whatever you got, this is your opportunity. So here is our chance. Here's our opportunity. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This is the this is the opportunities we have right now. Don't, don't think that the opportunities are, are out there somewhere. No, they're right here. They're here and now. You know, I was talking to somebody this week and talking about getting into church, professed salvation, so I was talking about getting into church, and they said, well, when I get, when I get some things straightened out, I'm going to get back in church. I said, you'll never get in church. They will always see you got things all crooked and messed up so that you'll never get in church. You understand? You don't, you, don't, you don't get things straightened out and then get right with God. You get right with God and He straightens it all out. That's why that's the order that it goes in. You just come back to God and He'll straighten you out. Uh, take, those, 
Take those opportunities that God presents to you and let's do them. Don't put it off. Don't, don't think it's out there somewhere. Now's the time we sow. Now's the time we don't get weary in well-doing. You know what the weary in well-doing is? You know what the well-doing is? It's sowing. We're sowing the seeds. And we're sowing acts of kindness. And we're bearing one another's burdens. And we're seeking to not only have the ministry of reconciliation and winning people to Christ, but the ministry of restoration. And while we're doing that, we're not trying to seek recognition. I don't, need, I don't need anybody to pat, pat me on the back and anybody to call my name out. I just want to just serve God. I'm not going to be envious of somebody else if they get attention. Praise the Lord for that. Glad they could do it. Glad they got blessed. By the way, preachers can fall into that. Oh, get, get up. This guy, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, just the, 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 the preachers can get critical of somebody who's got a bigger church than they do. And, and they get critical. The, uh, it's just, and, and a lot of it comes back to the very first part of that verse. They're desirous of vainglory. They're desirous of attention, recognition. See? God, God blesses somebody, you know what? 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. If God chooses to give a preacher 100-fold, praise the Lord for that. Thank God for that. And, and the hundredfold guy doesn't have to criticize the thirtyfold or the sixtyfold, and the thirty and sixty don't have to criticize the hundredfold. You know what? We just have to make sure we're sowing and reaping what God wants us to sow and reap. And that goes for every individual Christian as well. That that we don't get envious. See? And we're involved in the in this ministry of helping others and serving others. All men and especially those who are of the household of faith. We, we were, there's a couple things. We remember that when we help others, Jesus said, in as much as you've done one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. So we're really helping, and we're really serving Jesus Christ. But there's something else that Hebrews tells us. There says that we ought to be careful to entertain strangers because in doing so, some of us have entertained Angels unaware. You don't know that God hasn't sent you somebody that uh, is an angel to give us a test to see how we'll react to that. Oh, let's not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And especially they who are the household of faith. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for the privilege it is ours to serve you. And Lord, I, I, I want to be able to not be weary in well-doing. And Lord, I don't want to get caught up in needing recognition where I'm provoking others or envious of others. I want to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of restoration, mending broken disciples, bearing their burden, knowing and realizing that that could be me, that I'm no better than anyone else. We're here to help one another and build one another up and encourage one another in the faith carry one another's burdens to love each other as you love us and then father make us mindful that we reap what we sow oh help us to sow the kindness and the love and the compassion the encouragement that we desire to reap in our own life Make us that kind of a church. Make us that kind of a people. And Lord, I pray that in due season, we will see you bring in a harvest for your honor and for your glory. Remind us that you will give the increase. That we always will reap more than what we sow. But we'll reap it in your time. In your season. And so as we have opportunity, God, let us do good unto all men, and especially they.
people of the household of faith. We love you, Lord. Thank you for again for the privilege to serve you. Help us to be yielded to the Spirit of God. And may we do the work we do in his power and his strength. And do your work the way you desire it to be done. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. It's 128 if you need it. Let's sing that together. You got it? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed.